morning. Welcome to the uh, C-Talks uh, interview, Klaus Anders. Thank you very much for participating. Uh, I'm Debashish Day. I'm a partner at White & Case. I work in the finance and securitization area, and it's my pleasure to be uh, talking to you this morning. So thank you very much. Um, can you just, do you mind uh, spending a couple of minutes just talking about yourself, your role, and your company? And then we'll, um, we've got some interesting questions to ask you. All right, so very good morning. Uh, thanks for inviting me to this talk. Uh, I'm Klaus Anders Nistem. I'm CEO in Hoist Finance. I've been CEO uh, in Hoist Finance now for two and a half years, I guess. And prior to joining Hoist, uh, I was also CEO then for Lindorf. And as you might remember, Lindorf and Inter merged back in the days. And then I, I, I left uh, Lindorf and, and then decided later on to, to join Hoist. So, it's been a, a very interesting time in the industry. I think I've been CEO in the industry now for, I guess, six, almost seven years. So it's been a, quite an interesting time for the industry, for the sector, uh, for our clients, and definitely for our customers. Okay, thank you. So, I, you know, it was an, it's interesting to think about your particular business, given the backdrop of so much of what's going on, um, and particularly just looking at the nature of how economies have been affected across Europe, in particular amongst, you know, not only business lines, but also the people who are in the consumer sector, who have borrowings, so on and so forth. Um, but before we even get to your, you know, ultimately the, the underlying element of where cash flow comes from, I mean, one of the big challenges everybody has said is just running their, their global business in this kind of set of circumstances with you know, distance working, et cetera. So, you know, given the geographical spread of your operations, um, how have you had to implement, you know, changes in your working practices? You know, there are government restrictions being imposed on different national levels and they're all slightly different. So how have you coped with that? Yeah, no, it's um, unprecedented times, right? What we're living through, it is, uh... Very, um, very peculiar times. I was CEO um, for a bank in the financial crisis. Um, that was strange, but, but in many ways, this is a, a very different challenge. Of course, it's a pandemic and not a financial crisis per se, or the, the consequences are definitely financial, but it is a very different situation altogether. Um, so we were able to, to execute on our business continuity plans right away. Um, so in, in matter of, almost days, we had most of our employees working remotely, working from their home office. Uh, and still around 80% of our employees are working remotely. Um, you know, accessing our systems, accessing our portals, uh, being able to deploy our dialers um, and, and keep the shop open. So, so uh, mm -hmm. um, the thing is that if, if somebody had had told me or asked me, could you, you know, make sure that we in a matter of three weeks uh, uh, are up and running with everybody working from home? I said, sorry, that's not possible. That's not, uh, not, not just not doable. But we were able to do it nevertheless. Um, and, and I'm very happy about our digital capacities, our, the work we have done to standardize our, our so ecosystems of, of systems. Um, so, so uh, it's been um, a massive undertaking, of course, but we have been able to do so, and I'm really happy for, for this. And, and um, yeah, it's, it's a big, big, big job. And uh, I know, of course, that um, working from home in the home office is not uh, the best solution for everybody, in particular not with homeschooling, people working from their apartments, with family members around, fighting for ban, ban, um, bandwidth and capacity. It, it hasn't been easy for for everybody, but um, I think we've been, been doing it really well, and I'm really proud of the work that we've been able to do. Have you noticed, um, I mean, you know, obviously Hoist's roots are, are Nordic, but the reality is you have operations across Europe, you have operations in the yeah. UK. Have you noticed different challenges in, in, say, customer interactions? Obviously, this, as you said, dialing, interfacing, uh, dealing with customers, I mean, obviously people are different from country to country. 
yeah. was it more complicated or less complicated in particular countries or did you find that you could take a universal approach so um yeah good question i, I think that there are definitely um a spectrum of differences between different jurisdictions we we operate in 10 different markets and, and we have to of course uh, comply to local regulations and, and adapt to local requirements that hasn't really been a problem for us uh, we we take a lot of pride and a lot of um, effort into being, you know, um, using our three lines of defense that we have to do as a bank uh, to take care of our customers in the best possible way. Ensure that, uh, you know, um, the conversations that we're having with customers are, are being protected and, and safeguarded the way it should be. Uh, so that's been um, a lot of work for us to do that right. So we have been able to bring out uh, laptops, uh, chairs, um, uh, uh, you know, sh shelters, so that we are ensuring the the the, um, um, the best interest of, of our customers. So, I would say, yeah, there are there are certainly some some, some local differences, uh, but in, in general, um, um, our focus has been to take care of our customers. So, so we implemented, for instance. Uh, new customer engagement um, uh, regulations or, or procedures um, always making sure that if uh, a customer brought up uh, a topic around COVID-19 we would definitely make sure to to put in place uh, you know payment uh, holidays or or whatever that was required for them because our our interest is always aligned with our customers uh, and our promise to them is to be by our side and, and uh, help them every step of the way. So um, yeah, it's been, uh, there, are, there are differences, but uh, in many ways, the, the circumstances are the same, the customer needs are the same, and, and that's what we have to protect. Interesting. Have you noticed, obviously you're at the forefront of seeing uh, trends in a way that may be harder for some of us to see. So we have a number of government support schemes at play we have different uh, payment holidays at play across Europe. Um, we are in an unprecedented time of governments ordering businesses to shut. So there are inevitably people who can't work anymore. Hmm. Are you seeing a longer lead time in being able to uh, negotiate collection strategies with uh, your, you know, the consumer base? Uh, is there a trend that you, know, you are seeing coming out of, of this period? So there, there is one underlying trend which I think is quite important and that is that our business is pretty resilient also in the downturn. Uh, we saw that back in 2001 to the Asian crisis, we, we saw it to the financial crisis. So yeah, the, we are not insulated, we are, we are not uh, uh, you know, completely protected from, from downturns like the ones that we are seeing now, but, but of course the numbers are uh, unprecedented, I mean GDP drops around 20% in Europe in six months. Uh, I mean, we haven't seen that before. Uh, so the, the, the big question is really, is, the, is the, um, the capital markets, the financial markets, are they uh, still coupled to the real economy or are they two separating apart? Um, because if unemployment really start to bite um, and you see fundamental changes um, in the macroeconomic um, picture that, that that is going to hamper um, people's ability to make money uh, and make a living, um, that is going to be tougher. Um, so, so right now, uh, the schemes that are, that are put in place are certainly helping people to, to get by and get on. Uh, I hope uh, for a recovery, uh, how the shape of that recovery, I think we are debating, is it going to be a V-shape, an L-shape, a U-shape? A K shape, I saw the other day, so all kinds of uh, uh, letters being used to describe uh, this, this potential recovery. I hope it's going to be all right that we get a virus in place, uh, um, sorry, a uh, um, vaccine in place, yeah, and we can deal with the, the, the virus in a different way, and at least the death rates are, are more positive, but, but right now, as we speak, we are in the second wave, uh, and yesterday, a lot of measures were, were put in place, and in mm -hmm. different, different jurisdictions and different cities. Yeah. It's pretty tough times, I would say. So we are not insulated. We are pretty robust. Uh, collections have been holding up all right. 
Um, I mean, we have six and a half billion customers um, in 10 markets or thousands of portfolios. The average amount, uh, the average installment every month is 50 euros. So it's, it's, it, is, um, it is reasonably robust, I have to say. Um, one of my specialties is actually um, non-performing loan portfolios, you know, either the servicing, the buying or selling of them. And obviously we follow quite avidly large scale industrial um, servicers of those portfolios who buy and sell them just like Hoist. So it's interesting because I had, in my mind at least, thought the trend was, you know, a successful resolution of NPLs across Europe means actually there's less and less NPLs mm. as time goes by. The um, economic events of the last six months actually are reversing that trend. So um, do you believe that these circumstances will, for at least, you know, entities at the scale at Hoist, lead to a different approach to bidding for portfolios or uh, perhaps different geographies you might concentrate in, or is it just business as usual, but perhaps more volume? Mm. Yeah, so um, our strategy is to um, help people keep the commitments, of course, that's the customer side. But we also want to help our clients uh, to manage their balance sheets, um, and our clients are then, you know, ordinary banks in, in the European uh, market. We are in 10 markets. Um, we are in the largest European markets. We have, no, um, we have no ambition to go into new markets. We think it's more important to be, um, have scale in the markets that we're in. So we're prioritizing uh, increasing our market share. Uh, and we're doing so by um, even adding to uh, our asset classes. We, we've done primarily unsecured consumer MPLs. We have done more and more secured MPLs. We are definitely also buying performing loans since we have the banking license. So, so the idea is to broaden the base of, of the type of assets we are buying. Um, you are certainly right um, about the volume. I, I mean, prior to the uh, financial crisis, the, the volume of MPLs on banks balance sheets in Europe were around five, 600 billion euros. Uh, in the aftermath of the financial crisis 10 years ago, we climbed all the way up to 1.3 trillion, I believe. Now, 10 years after and, and, and just before COVID-19, the NPL level had come down to uh, a level of around 650 billion euros again. So back to sort of pre-financial crisis levels. What we, what we see now is, of course, that NPLs are growing again. Uh, Banks are increasing their provision, provisions for, for um, NPLs. Uh, so it's hard to, 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 to say exactly how much the NPL stock uh, will grow again. I, I think maybe we'll see the same level as we saw after the financial crisis, around, around 1.3 trillion. Uh, so um, I think we are going to be an important part of the financial ecosystem uh, you know, in hoist in the years to come. I think we have a role to play. And I have in mind that uh, as, as the industry has matured, uh, we have been investing alongside our competitors in processes and training and systems. So we do the work we do uh, more efficient, more effective than the banks do themselves. So I think we are a very useful and, and necessary um, you know, wheel in the machinery of, of, um, of uh, financials in, in Europe. I mean, you, you touch on competitors and that's, <clears throat> I think, another topic I wanted to raise with you because we clearly have seen um, in, you know, Southern Europe as, as uh, there's been an evolution of servicing platforms, we've seen consolidation in order to build scale because clearly for efficiencies, once you get this right, if you can run it at scale, it becomes a, a business where profitability works better. So do you uh, have any views on, will this be a trend um, uh, you know, across the industry with uh, larger scale uh, industrialization of this sort of servicing platforms? Are, are there any particular jurisdictions that are more likely to see consolidation than others? Yeah, no, I, 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 uh, I support um that uh, thesis, I think consolidation will continue. 
Um, I mean, the interim and Lindorf merger was, uh, of course, the largest that has, that has happened. Interim now is, is clearly uh, number one, and, and they have a, like a balanced business model, almost 50-50 servicing and, and, and uh, purchasing. Um, there are other large purchasers like ourselves some, uh, in Europe. Um, I think, and then if you look at the, the M&A activity over the last few years, um, the activity has actually increased. It hasn't reduced, um, but there are kind of smaller bolt-on transactions and, and acquisitions. So I think uh, more regulation, more standardization, more industrialization are the key drivers for further consolidation, which I think is going to happen. It's hard to say you know, when and, and with whom, uh, but I think more consolidation will happen. I think that will be a, a healthy thing uh, for the industry. Um, it will drive professionalism. It will drive focus on topics like ESG, I think. Um, and and um, from that point of view, it will be good for, for, for clients and, and customers alike. Um, so yeah, I believe consolidation is going to be a, a, a theme also in the next few years. It's, um, this hasn't stopped. And another area that you, you touched on digitization um, a little bit earlier, one, one of the things that, um, you know, if you pick up any financial journal, any newspaper, they, they just are constantly using the term fintech. In my view, fintech has often been a front end type of application where banks are digitizing the interface with customers, right? So obviously that has been one element of it and then it's allowed intermediaries to enter the market as well. But you're in a different part of the financial ecosystem. Mm. You're not necessarily frontline originating fresh loans and you're not seeking to disrupt what banks do currently. Some of those are your customers. So what would you say FinTech means to you? What, what, for a business like Hoist, what does FinTech mean? Does it have any relevance or, or not? Right, so our, our ambition in Hoist is to be the digital leader of our industry. Um, uh, we are a bank. That means that uh, seeking inspiration from FinTechs uh, or even work with FinTechs is highly relevant. Um, I think uh, my, our industry, the, the collection industry is in many ways rather old fashioned. Um, it's still a, a primarily a contact center um, focused uh, business. We, we send physical letters to customers and we call them. Uh, I think that's reasonably old fashioned uh, in a way. And, and have in mind that talking about financial challenges is sometimes uh, there's a bit of stigma in this. There's a bit of uh, um, sensitivities around talking with somebody about financial uh, challenges and, and stress. Um, and don't forget that a lot of the, the, the loans that we are servicing now or have acquired, they were originally originated digitally and not, not by having uh, somebody uh, you know, write papers and sign documents. So we, we as an industry have to step up our game um, and we want to lead that um, development in Hoist Finance. I think we're doing so. Uh, for instance, we are now using open banking uh, as, a, as a tool uh, to, to support and help our, our, our customers. We have launched a, a customer support platform in the, in, in the UK um, because if you ask our customers what do they need, how can we help them? And some people will say, I actually need a job because uh, I'm, my, my willingness to pay is there, but I, I don't, just don't have the means, right? So if I had a job, I could definitely maybe pay back more. And the second thing people would say is that, yeah, uh, I wish I could pay more, but you know, we have all these household bills that I also have to pay. Uh, so our value proposition now to some of these customers are partnerships. We are partnered up with app jobs uh, so that they can, so customers can log in and, and, and try to find a job, right, uh, digitally. Um, we have launched a benefit tracker because we know that a lot of people cannot navigate uh, the system and don't know what ben benefits they are entitled to. So if you can help them find out the, what benefits they really should be receiving, great. And as a point number three, uh, if they can check uh, 
um, if they're having the right subscriptions, are, are their gas bill what it should be? Can they find a better offer? Uh, great. So we are working with partners to, to, to find ways to help our customers in a smarter and better way. And I think this is the way forward, right? To really find ways to help our customers. So this is the very core of how we think about uh, uh, our positioning in the marketplace. We really want to help people keep their commitments. And any way we can do that is beneficial for the customer because we really want to have customers work their way back to financial inclusion. So being financially excluded from society is a really heavy uh, burden to carry mm -hmm. for people. So I think that's go to the core and, and this has to be done digitally, right? We cannot do this through, uh, through phone or through letters. It has to be intuitive, has to be accessible, available, um, and um, done in a way that people better understand how they can manage their lives. Uh, and, uh, and I found this extremely interesting, I have to say, right? And, and, and the FinTech <laughs> industry, they are in many ways at the forefront because they are more, perhaps more customer centric, more customer driven in many ways than we are. But we have six and a half million customers. We have a banking license. We want to become digital or be more big digital. So, you know, uh, why not work with, uh, with FinTechs and to, to, to deliver on this? Moving from the micro at the customer to the macro, you, you know, you remind me that you're a bank, which means that you're clearly subject to regulation at the EU level. Is there anything that you are, see on the horizon that is either uh, an impediment to growth or something that you know worries you at, at night as a CEO <laughs> that could that could slow you down on, on your mission? Um, I sleep well at night, uh, which is good. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I always I've always said that regulation is our friend, right? I think it's a good thing to be regulated. I think it is a good thing from um, from an investor's point of view. I think it's a good thing from customer point of view and a client point of view. So for, for most stakeholders or all stakeholders, being a regulated institution is basically a good thing. Having said that, we, we, we have had a bit of regulatory headwind uh, as of lately, right? In 2018, we got uh, some really, uh, you know, uh, surprising regulation um, in our hands to, to deal with. One was the change in risk rates. Another one was this MPL backstop. Um, I think that the, the underlying reasons for implementing these regulations from a regulatory standpoint is something we can, we can recognize and acknowledge. They're, they're there for a good reason. But they're not perhaps entirely fit for purpose uh, for us, uh, you know, being a bank working in the secondary market for anything else. So we had to find solutions to deal with this and, and we are finding solutions to deal with this. So that has been, you know, the, the same for all the way since 1996 when we, when we got our banking license in place. So we've always been able to deal with changes in regulations and I think we are going to be able to do so also in the future. So perhaps the most interesting uh, tool in the toolbox that we then have used uh, to deal with this has been securitization. And, and I think that has worked really well. We have done uh, two transactions and we continue uh, to, to, to do so. Okay. Well, listen, I'm very conscious that we're near the uh, end of the time I was allotted to speak to you, and you probably have to get back to your day job. So I really appreciate, Klaus Sanders, you taking the time to speak to me today and uh, participating in C-Talks. So thank you very much for your time. Um, I look forward to hearing more about uh, what Hoist does in the next uh, period where so much is happening. Thank you. It was great to be with you. Have a good day. Yeah, nice to speak to you. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers.